Good afternoon, everybody. So welcome to the second uh, season of the online seminar series, um, Machine Learning Needs uh, Mathematical Optimization. Um, as you know, we decided to come back after the summer and we will be running this uh, seminar until, uh, say, mid-December. Uh, uh, and this uh, online seminar series will also include um, a young session where we will have also um, young speakers presenting their work in progress. But let me focus on the presentation today. Um, today uh, we are very honored to have uh, Leo Liberti as our uh, speaker. So as we all know, he's a full professor at the Ecole Polytechnique. And in the past, he has held uh, positions at IBM, Politecnico di Milano, Imperial College, to name a few. So he's a leading expert in uh, global optimization, combinatorial optimization, and mixed integer nonlinear optimization. In terms of data science, uh, Leo has contributed to language, lang natural language processing, but also distance geometry. And on the latter, he has an invited review in top, which is the operations research journal from the Spanish Statistics and Operations Research Society. He is a key contributor to the use of optimization to address uh, complex industrial uh, systems, uh, has more than uh, 100 papers in, uh, in um, uh, academic journals in our field. Um, to name a few, he has uh, EGER papers, mathematical programming, mathematics of operations research, but also in applied fields such as in uh, energy. He's also very successful in fundraising and the funding comes from the EU, for instance, um, an ITN uh, where uh, he collaborates with the other universities in the uh, MINOA um, project, and, but also national public and private um, uh, funding. So for us, it's a great honor to have him uh, today opening our second season. So uh, the floor is yours. Uh, we got... Um, more than 50 people uh, in the audience and yeah they keep coming so uh thank you uh, we thank are you Dolores, the honor is mine actually and uh, thank you very much for the invitation uh, i can't thank you enough also for the invitation to write a survey for top that was a uh, huge fun uh, i'm not going to talk about that today instead today i'm going to talk about random projections in mathematical programming now this is probably as close to um as close to both um, math machine learning and optimization um, as distance geometry really is, um, but but this time it's a, a different set of works, and I think it's um, it's probably even closer to optimization than distance geometry in the sense that I am uh, looking at how to reduce the size of mathematical programs, and uh, at the same time ensure that you find approximate optima. Okay, so this is this is the overall topic, and I've published. Um, Four, five or six papers in this in this uh, in this topic over the years, over the last few years, in fact, and uh, this is probably the first time that I attempt to look back and, and you know and see the whole host of things that I worked on uh, during the last few years. All right, so this is actually this is joint work with Claudia D'Ambrosio, Benedetto Manca, Pierre-Louis Borion, and Ki Wu. But in fact, the two uh, most active people would be uh, Pierre-Louis and and Ki. All right. Um, oh, and by the way, there's uh, there's there starts to be a literature uh, apart from my own studies um, on optimization um, in the context of of um, random projections, and much of it is actually due to um, the next ML needs MO speaker, Coralia Cartis, uh, who will talk uh, next time. Um, so I, if you're interested in these topics, and I, I don't know whether she'll talk about that, but uh, in case she does, then you know she she also has uh, many things to say. Anyway, so let me introduce what um, um, what random projections are. Then I'll talk about their uh, direct application to data, which has been known for um, quite a number of years. And then I'll talk about uh, the uh, theoretical part of applying um, RPs, random projections, to formulations. And then I'll, I'll show some case studies. All right, so the gist of random projections is that you have a big blue matrix, okay, this one here, um, that is your data matrix. The columns are records, for example, um, and uh, the, well, 
the rows would be features of uh, of the records. Okay, and you have to do something with this with this database. I don't know. You have to uh, maybe cluster it or do something else. Um, and in fact, it's too large uh, in order to cluster it uh, efficiently. So instead, what you want to do is you want to um, somehow lose some of the features, but you don't know which ones, okay? Because because you don't know what the features actually are. Um, so these uh, these random injections are a set of techniques that will help you do exactly that. Um, and uh, what they ensure uh, while projecting, while reducing the dimensionality of the blue matrix is a sort of approximate congruence. You can see what they kind of aim at ensuring, okay? For any two columns, AI and AJ, um, the uh, two norm of the original columns, the sorry, the, the two distance, the L2 distance of the original columns would be more or less uh, the L2 distance of the projected columns, okay? So let's see what the projection is like. Um, you have to sample the green matrix, which is very short and very fat, okay? Uh, so when you do the, um, uh, the uh, scalar, the inner products like this, okay, um, you end up with something like the black matrix, which has the same number of columns as the blue matrix, okay, so each column still represents a record, uh, but it has m m fewer, fewer rows, okay, so you've compressed somehow the, spa the feature space. Um, now, the fact how how do you make the green matrix this is how you, this is one way of making it it's not the only way but it's mo probably the most popular way uh, t be a k times m matrix where every component is uh, sampled from an old, or normal distribution um, with mean zero and uh, standard deviation one over square root of k and k uh, is low k is much lower than the number of columns um, it's let's say logarithm of n. I'll be more precise in the next slide, in fact, well, in the next few slides. Um, this uh, this uh, um, guarantee, this sort of guarantee that I left informal for the time being, is guaranteed actually WAP. And what WAP means is with arbitrarily high probability. Uh, so this is a probability of a set of events depending on some parameter k, um, such that uh, as k increases, the probability of k happening uh, increases, approaches one exponentially fast, as in this curve that you can see here, okay? Uh, so it suffices to um, have moderate uh, to low values of k to ensure that these k, uh, that these ek events actually do happen. All right. Uh, so this is the uh, formal the formal statement of the johnson linda strauss lemma, probably the best known result in random projections. Uh, given the matrix A, which is seen here as a set of columns in our M, um, and the set of columns is n columns, and some epsilon, which will control the approximation ratio, there is a k which is now a little more precise. It's of the order of 1 over epsilon squared times logarithm of n and a k times m matrix t, which is our projector, okay, such that the following happens. As, as you can see, the projected, the two distance, the L2 distance between projected columns is sandwiched between 1 minus epsilon and 1 plus epsilon of the original distance, well, of the L2 distance of the original columns, okay? So this is how the JLL uh, presents itself. Now, the proof of the JLL, I'll, I'll dispense with it because I won't have time, but uh, what happens is that you, you prove, it's a probabilistic method proof. So you prove that A and TA, that was a black matrix TA, um, the, the probability that they are approximate congruent, in, congruent exceeds some positive value. Okay, so there must exist at least one matrix T that has this property. Okay, so in practice though, um, this uh, very low uh, probability is not really an issue. First of all, you can resample T sufficiently many times so that you get, uh, by union bound, you get uh, as, as high a probability as you want. On the other hand, empirically, sampling just a few times will do. And in fact, uh, I, only, only, I only ever sample once. So uh, you, I sample once, I sample T, um, I just sample once and then I use it. And then most of the times I'm, 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 I'm lucky or I'm happy. Um, why does this happen? It's most because in fact, this, um, this uh, result here that the average over all Ts, that the um, L2 distance between the projected columns should be equal to the L2 distance between the original columns is actually a deterministic statement, okay? So the means uh, project well. Uh, now, the point is that you might have um, some standard deviation, some discrepancy from the mean. And um, this, um, all these random projections, 
they imply the use of um, some um, concentration of measure argument to show that these discrepancies are actually low, okay? So why do I allow myself to sample just once? It's mostly because when you have big matrices such as the A matrix, um, where you don't know much of the structure, um, the chances are that there's also some errors in the data. And so it doesn't really matter whether you will get something wrong because what you'll get wrong here in this uh, in this uh, guarantee statement is that most of these mo for most of these pairs of vectors the guarantee will hold and maybe for a few the guarantee won't hold okay so this is how how you fail uh, to to satisfy the l but it doesn't really matter because in practice if you're clustering the columns a few um, distances that are not well maintained uh, don't really change the whole result, okay? Most of the times. Okay, so uh, another surprising fact is the case independent of the original number of dimensions m, which I find surprising because, well, you chose m because you thought it was correct uh, to represent your, your data, but in fact, it has nothing to do with representing the distances, uh, it only, which only depends on the number of columns, okay? Not, not the number of features. So, the real the realm of application of random projections is actually data um as as i presented the theory um so i i've tested for example um a clustering of a few images and you can see that it took me 0 0.4 seconds to obtain this uh answer but when i projected the uh, vectors representing these images i obtained this the very same clustering um with only a fraction of the time so this is where uh, random projections come in very useful, okay? So they reduce time, the time for performing certain operations on data. Now, the fact that I had exactly the same answer, well, that was lucky, maybe I, I would have, I might have slightly different answers, but not very different answers. If I wanted to have perfect answers or, or almost perfect answers, I would have to tune the epsilon carefully and I would have to sample my ET, my random projections several times until my the probability of, of uh, failure is very low. All right, so, but let's see now the focus of my work. It's in, in projecting formulations. Now, projecting data and projecting formulations are completely different things, okay? So whereas in projecting data, we might want to really just ensure the L2 distances, in projecting formulations, we want to ensure approximate feasibility and approximate opt optimality. We also want to retrieve a solution for the original MP. We're not happy with just uh, finding the optimal and approximately optimal value or, or you know, the fact that um, some infeasible problem projects with high probability to an infeasible projected problem. Um, we also want to retrieve a solution in case that the problem is feasible. Uh, and this may be easy in some cases, but hard in other cases, as we'll see. Um, so uh, the, uh, the, the two um, technical difficulties that I've had to face in bringing these data projection techniques to formulations is the fact that approximate congruence does not trivially imply approximate optimality. Optimal objects, the objective functions can be anything, and they can be linear, they can be quadratic. We've, we've tested a few, we've worked out theories for a few uh, LP, uh, well, sorry, mathematical programming paradigms. Um, and it's always a challenge to transfer a result like the JLL to feasibility and optimality. And the other big challenge is that J, the JLL projects finite point sets. So I've specified that uh, the, A, um, the A object is either a set element or a, a matrix, matrix with n columns, but it can't be an infinite point set, okay? So the JLL will, would not hold with infinite point sets. You, there are some results similar to the JLL for those cases, but the JLL will not hold. Okay, uh, whereas the, if you want to project something, if you want something like a formulation, uh, there are decision variables, there are symbols that represent or may represent infinite sets. So in fact, there's, a, there's an inherent difficulty in passing from data to formulations, and those are the decision variables. They represent the output of the problem, which you don't know yet, so it's not data. Okay, it's the possibility of data. It's the possibility of assigning uh, values to the to the vectors, to the variable uh, decision variables. So so far we've dealt with LP, linear programming, SDP, and conic programming in general. Uh, QP uh, with linear constraints. QP with one um, non-linear constraint, with one quadratic constraint, which is like a ball constraint, and then a single problem, but the k-means problem. So this is not a paradigm. This is not like, I don't know, MINLP. But the k-means problem turns out to be 
in MINLP. So I'm quite happy that this, you know, I, I could finally reach the stage where I projected something that has an integer variable in. Um, but, but of course, you know, most of the theoretical work uh, was in continuous optimization. I, I'm saying of course, because in fact, it, it's something that concerns me. I still don't quite don't know how to project integer variables. Uh, with continuous variables, it's easier probably because the, you can see the projection, uh, projection technique was, was a conti an inherently continuous one, okay? So it doesn't matter if A contains zeros and ones, once you uh, multiply it by uh, T, it will contain anything. All right, so let's look at linear programming first. And um, first of all, with uh, let's look at linear feasibility, okay? So we're going to, um, to um, just look at AX equals V to B subject to some other constraints that we're going to call big X, okay? And for example, linear the, the linear feasibility problem would have X equals the uh, non-negative orthant. Integer feasibility would have uh, this kind of definition. Okay, so if X is finite, we have this theorem, which is probably the easiest theorem that I can prove to you, and maybe it will stay the only theorem that I proved to you today, uh, but I want to go into the details here because it shows you how, how you deal with these things, okay? So if X is finite, everything is easier, exactly because the JLL deals with finite sets, but let's look at this. So first of all, T is um, a JLL random projection, and B, 1 to an are the data of the restricted linear membership instance. So uh, a1 to an would be the columns of a, and b would be the right hand side. Um, and we want to kind of want to show whether uh, b is actually e to a x, uh, where wherever uh, whenever x uh, ranges in in big X. Okay. So the first statement is trivial, and it says that if the if your problem is feasible, okay, so if the feasibility problem is a yes instance, then the projected feasibility problem where you pre-multiply both sides of the equation by t, by linearity of the linear operator t, of course, this is also feasible. So this very important result, although it's trivial to show, says that if you have a, a feasible LP, okay, and you uh, pre-multiply the a, this the the equations by t okay and you get something like this then what you obtain the projected linear feasibility instance you obtain is also feasible so if one is feasible the other is feasible now number two says something different it talks about the uh certificate supposing that x is not a good certificate for the feasibility instance then the probability that x is a good phys a, a good um, the x is uh, a, a good certificate for the projected feasibility instance is low okay in fact i've i've written the contrapositive here the probability that x is not a good certificate for this linear feasibility instance exceeds 1 minus uh, something that decreases exponentially really fast so this is a wap kind of result and this is an immediate application of the jll because you can look at the set of vectors b a1 up to a n and you can simply uh, look at the distance between b uh, and uh, and the other term, okay, x uh, t a i, okay. So this distance projects, and if the, there is a difference here, then this distance is greater than zero in the original uh, space. And that means that in the projected space, um, this the same also follows, okay. So this is a straightforward corollary of the JLL. Now let's look at the number three, which is the one where we uh, do a little more work, but not very much. Now suppose that um, the, that X is finite, okay? And now that the original problem is actually infeasible. So for every Y in big X, you never satisfy um, the constraints, okay? Then we can use the union bound on part two. And if you don't know what the union bound is, go look it up. It's a very, very uh, basic technique for dealing with probability uh, for probable events. Um, then the probability that for every uh, Y, the, um, the projected instance is infeasible has the same kind of form as number two. You can see that the difference here is that the uh, cardinality of X 
got um, got put into the uh, factor of the falling exponential. Okay, so this is a typical effect of the union bound. Um, the uh, the the conclusion is that this kind of thing is WAP as long as the cardinality of X is not too large, okay? So for example, if the cardinality of X were infinite, then this statement would make no sense. If the cardinality of X uh, were um, increasing exponentially with K, then this would be maybe a high probability. So it wouldn't tell us that it's WAP. It wouldn't tell us that it's a full, that, you know, the probability of achieving uh, this uh, quickly goes to one. All right. So this is the kind of st statements and proofs that uh, are involved in working with um, with random projections. OK, Le so Le lock. Yes. yes, we have a question. Um, uh, if you don't mind to take a question. Sure. No, no, I don't. Wolfram, um, would you like to state your question yourself? Uh, he was asking whether the normality is an assumption. Whether uh, normality is an assumption? R Wolf, Wolfram, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Is, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, yes I can I hear can. you. Sorry, I was mute. <laughs> Somebody muted me. Now I see that you can even see me here uh, with my video. OK, good. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Leo, I have the question. Um, when you write about probability, yeah, um, you are talking about uh, your random projections. That means you are talking about your uh, assumption that you made on slide one, slide one or two, where you had this yes. projection of size uh, norm, normal zero one over squared of k, right? Uh, and I was wondering how sensitive uh, whatever you are talking about now, how sensitive it is to this, uh, say, sub Gaussian or uh, assumption so um, I this is nice theory I agree with that but is it really so that I can legally ask the question what about fatter tails how do your probability bounds look like when you have slightly fatter tails say exponential yeah not normal um, I, so you, I you, don't you, I don't know I don't know. Um, there are some studies in there. You can look at the book by Vershinin. So I'm, I'm sort of taking the material from random projections, really the classical ones that, that are sampled sub -gauche in a sub -gauche way and applying them uh, with the basic machinery. But I don't know how far you can push, uh, you know, the sampling with other, with other distributions. Hmm, okay, good. So may, may I then uh, say this is, uh, 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 um, uh, very good for, say, phenomena that I can see mm -hmm. in TA space uh, that yes. are typically linear. Can I say that? Because normality tends to uh, essentially extract principal components in the end of the day, yeah? um, if you want to say. So if you hit the principal components with T, you are fantastic. Then you find everything. Super. I mean, maybe this is goes too far. This question. I just wanted to know how the probability bounds will depend on okay. your less, less, less uh, uh, thin tails. Yeah, that's what I wanted to know. And yeah, I, that... I don't know how to answer the question. In fact, but I can refer you to this book by Vershinin, uh, which mm -hmm. is just behind my screen. Maybe I can take it out of my. Okay, so this <laughs> one. This take is it a Very out. nice. Okay. Can you see it? Yeah. 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 Uh, sure. yeah. All right. <laughs> Okay, okay thank you now, very much, uh, no thank problem. You. Thank you for the question. All right, so let's go back. Um, okay, so uh, this this theorem doesn't quite settle linear programming because in linear programming, big X is going to be uncountable. Okay. However, we are able to also set to uh, project separating hyperplanes. So uh, we've seen that the real issue is not feasibility. If, you, if your LP is feasible, uh, the application of the matrix T will make the projected problem feasible. So we, we uh, focus on infeasibility, okay? So, and we take um, the, one of the alternatives of Farkash Lemma, the one that says that if it's not feasible, then you can separate, uh, there's a separating hyperplane. And we show that we can project, this is another easy proof, but I won't have time to go into it. Um, uh, you, you can project the separating hyperplane and what you obtain is uh, from this 
then you obtain that, which is exactly what you wanted to obtain, and for similarly for uh, for the other uh, for the other projected uh, vectors. Okay, so as soon as you can prove a theorem like this, then linear programming is well, linear feasibility is kind of done. Uh, in fact, this is not what we do. Uh, we want we we've proved the theorem with. Uh, more difficulties uh, but that gave us a better approximation and so this is not exactly what you'll find in uh, the math, math of our paper on the other hand i think that the, the full statement of the linear feasibility projection theorem says given a delta and look look at what i'm, I'm doing here i'm no, no longer using the wap kind of statement i'm sort of giving myself uh, how close i want to be to one then given this delta, and so given my, my precision in probability, there exists sufficiently large M and N such that for any feasibility input A and B, where A is N times N, we can sample a random K times M matrix with A is much smaller than M, so that if original LFP is feasible, then the uh, uh, projected LFP is feasible and vice versa. And of course, the vice versa is the difficult part of the theory. Okay, so now the optimality projection theorem is going to exploit the feasibility projection theorem, at least in my slides, because I only have time for sketching, uh, whereas in the paper, it doesn't really do that. It, it proves things anew. On the other hand, so let's, let's look at the optimality projection theorem. We have the original problem here and the projected problem here. Um, you can see that here we are projecting constraints. We're not really projecting variables, so we have fewer equality constraints. Um, we assume that uh, P... Um, is feasible and bounded, and we assume that all, the, all of the optimum of P satisfy this bounded, boundedness condition, okay? And so we can prove that given a delta, um, uh, this delta is not exactly the same as this delta. This is not a precision, precision probability, this is a pre precision in value. So value of P minus delta and va the value of P sandwich, the value of uh, the projected problem, okay? There are some more conditions on this delta, unfortunately, which makes this... Um, this precision not really controllable a priori okay so this is like a quality statement more than a quantity statement uh the proof sketch well if you look of uh, one side is really easy it just you just realize that in fact the project the projected problem is a relaxation of the original problem because you are aggregating constraints okay that's all and for the other direction in fact you uh, look at you turn optimality into feasibility by writing a constraint instead of an objective function uh, and say that cx is equal to the value of p minus delta okay of course if you choose delta greater than zero this is going to be infeasible okay because uh, there are no values that are less that have uh, objective value less the optimal one less than the optimal one and so you can apply the infeasibility projection theorem um, and then you just turn things around and out pops uh, what you wanted to have now, uh, when in fact it's very easy to prove that the solution, the solutions of TP of the uh, projected problem, um, are actually feasible in P with zero probability. So they're almost never feasible in, in P. Okay, so we need a different method to retrieve the original solution, and what we've devised is an approximate method. Um, we've, we extract, of course, we want to solve TP. We don't want to solve P, okay, because this is the whole point. Uh, we want to solve the projected one and find the solution of the op of the uh, original one. Okay, so uh, we can extract from the solver the optimal basis of TP, and then this basis H. Uh, has um, cardinality k, so a h the columns of a corresponding to this basis um, is makes uh, make a tall and slim matrix. Um, m times k is tall and slim, uh, so we can solve the k times k system, uh, which is a pseudo inverse here uh, technique. Um, a uh, transpose h a h x h equals a transpose h b. Okay, so we find a solution xh which only concerns um, very few uh, very few components okay but then we pad x with zeros we we make up x by xh and all zeros and um, we prove that there's a small feasibility error with uh, arbitrarily high probability now this kind of assures that you you're going to have a x equals to b so unfortunately uh, the small feasibility error is going to be um, 
observed into the only other constraints possible that are these ones. So we obtain original solutions that are slightly negative, which is bizarre for somebody who does optimization because you wouldn't think, you, you might accept some, some infeasibility here, but you would never accept, I don't know, that you need to put a, a certain, a negative quantity of a certain number of, uh, of food or nutrients to ensure something, to ensure a diet. So, so it's something that is not exactly so, so pleasing, okay, but this is the result we have. Uh, so these are infeasible random instances, and uh, the whole game here is to observe how many uh, wrong classifications we make, how many times we solve um, a projected instance, and in fact the original and and it's and it, and it's um, the original was infeasible, but the projected is feasible. Okay, so this is the only thing we count, and you can see that wrong is always at zero. Now 0.0, .0 doesn't mean zero. Uh, there may be some. 0.000 and then something because we've tested many many instances um but in fact it reduces to you know this technique war working most of the times okay um as for feasible random instances we picked an epsilon uh, at 0 0.2 and this is an empirical choice and you can observe that the cpu time is in favor of the original problem when the problem is small because it takes time to project and then to um, retrieve the solution. So uh, the CPU T is really the CPU uh, for, in order to not just to solve the, C, the projected problem, but to, to go from the original problem to an original solution by means of the projected problem. So there's uh, the projection, the sampling, the projection, the solution of the projected problem, and then the uh, retrieval, okay? Uh, now you can see that this is slower, but then when the big sizes kick in, you can see that um, uh, the CPU time is in favor of uh, projecting. Uh, projecting. And now the um, negativity error, you can see that it's non-zero, but it's got this nice feature that is that this average and negativity, uh, negativity error decreases. Okay, so this is not too bad. And this objective uh, this objective error is really the cost error. You can see this here, and we want it to be close to zero. And in fact, it is uh, rather close to zero, so we're doing well. Now let's look at conic programming. Um, now, in order to extend our work on linear programming, we use the concept of a Jordan algebra. My introduction to Jordan algebra today will be very, very limited, but it's a formal abstraction of, of all of the nice uh, self called cones that we use in, in uh, mathematical programming. And the point is that you can construct eigenvalues in an abstract way and prove a spectral theorem in an abstract way. And this is all that really takes to talk about uh, cones, it turns out. Okay, so a real algebra is a vector space over R with an abstract product. And so you can sort of uh, take products between vectors so you can have a vector squared, okay? Um, it, it also has some other properties which I'm not going to use in, this, uh, in these slides. Some examples, for example, if, if you want to take the, uh, uh, the non-negative orthant in Rn, so the very the useful LP paradigm, you can use the component-wise product between vectors. If you want to look at SOCP, you have this other product, okay, where you write a vector in Rn plus 1, like A0 and then A bar, and the bar would be uh, A1 up to An. And uh, the first component of the vector is the inner product between the bars, so A bar and B bar. Uh, and the, the other components are A0 times B bar plus B0 times A bar. This is weird, but it works. And for real symmetric matrices, you use this uh, commutator, which uh, gives you uh, the STP. Okay, so in fact, the construction works as follows. First of all, given a vector A in, an, in the algebra, you can um, work out the degree uh, as the largest R such that one A, A squared up to A R are linearly independent over the vector space. Okay, so this gives you the degree of A. Um, the polynomials are, co are constructed by means of plus and, uh, and the times, the, the multiplication by, uh, between vectors. Eigenvalues are defined by minimal polynomials, and the spectra, uh, as a completely abstract spectral theorem can be proved. As you can see, for every element of the algebra, you can find uh, some values, lambda 1 to lambda r, and some vectors c1 to cr in the algebra itself, such that you can write uh, a in terms of the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors, and you also have these uh, sort of um, um, orthogonal properties uh, between the vectors, okay? 
Now, the trace can be defined by some of eigenvalues. The inner product in function of the trace induces a norm in the algebra. And now the positive semi-definiteness is uh, given by the fact that there exists a b such that a is equal to b squared, okay? So this is how you construct all of the concepts that are used in um, uh, improving, um, you know, programming over a cone. Okay, so this construction is due to many people in the past, but uh, I think that Farid Ali wrote, wrote a nice introduction as a chapter of a book. Um, okay, so in order to project uh, conic programs, we write the primal and the dual here. And in fact, we make, we make these two assumptions, which we already made for LP. Uh, feasible instances are explicitly bounded by theta and we also need strong duality uh, on the cone programs. This is not a math, uh, this is not an issue in linear programming, but it's an issue in SOCP and SDP. Um, all right. Now we again project the constraints. So as you can see, this is where T happens to be. The dual sees T and creep in, in the objective function. And uh, I'm not gonna say much about the techniques used here. Um, but in fact, the approximate and optimality guarantees um, end up using this additive error term, which is not ideal because again, it uses the dual solution. Um, but um, so it's, it's not a great guarantee and the solution retrieval is very similar to what we do in LP. Okay, and the proof is a little different. In fact, the proofs of these things um, I think they are clearer than the proofs in the LP case because they are forced to be more abstract, okay? Um, you, mathematically speaking, they are clear. Okay, so let's see how this performs. The tests on, on infeasible random SDPs, um, they are very successful. Success rate is 100% if epsilon is kept, is kept low enough. If I increase epsilon, I start to lose uh, resolution, okay? And I get some errors and if I get up to 0 0.2 nothing so all of the all of the infeasible um, or, original problems would project to feasible projected problems so there's a there's an art to this deciding epsilon unfortunately it's not a science it's an art okay um, the tests on feasible random LPs they are both good and bad in a certain sense they are bad because you can see that this uh, error of happening between the error measuring uh, the value of P and the value of the projected problem, uh, it's quite high. So there's a big difference. On the other hand, once we retrieve the solution, X tilde, um, the, the solution, the retrieved solution performs really well and has an error of zero. So in this case, although the projected problem doesn't give you a good evaluation of the objective function of the optimal objective function value with respect to the original problem, it, the, uh, for some reasons, the, the, the retrieved solution uh, works extremely well. Okay, and well, the CPU time, of course, decreases, uh, but this we expect. So let's switch to quadratic programming. I'm going really fast because I don't have much time. Um, so this is the formulation I'm using. Um, and in this particular part of the uh, talk, we will see that the uh, projection is not applied to the constraints. In quadratic programming, with these inequality constraints, we're going to project the variables instead. Okay, so we start from this formulation where the t's are scattered about in uh, a certain way in order to make uh, the dimensionality fit. But what, what is happening here is that we're replacing x by t times x, okay? So we are multiplying a vector of decision variables by a matrix t. And this is not exactly what should happen in the jo johnson lindestrauss lemma, according to the johnson lindestrauss lemma. So uh, in fact, our proofs are more complicated here in this paper because we have to take account of this, okay, of this fact. We are, we're doing something that doesn't it immediately translate uh, to uh, the mechanisms that make the JLL work. Okay, so anyway, we set u equals to t of x, and this is what we obtain. We obtain something with fewer variables, okay, because we know that um, this t is k times n, and x is n, so this is only k, and k is logarithm of n. Okay, so now we uh, simply replace this big matrix by something else, by another name. This is, we're just renaming things so that it's easier to recognize that what you obtain in the end is simply another Q 
QP, okay, so this, this is the same as this. So it's another QP, but with a smaller sizes. Okay, so N has become K, and K is uh, proportional to the logarithm of N. The solution retrieval in this case is trivial. Okay, so there's no problem. Um, oh, by the way, I'm not going into many details, but I'm going to send the slides to Dolores and you can look at the details later on. Um, the approximation results here um, assume certain things, boundedness like usually. Um, we also assume that we know uh, a circumscribing sphere centered at the origin that contains uh, the, uh, uh, the feasible region with radius r. Um, so we have two, we define two problems, two projected problems. This one, which is t times p, which we've already seen, and this t p epsilon, where we make uh, the constraints tighter, okay, by adding a constant on the left hand side. So these two uh, will sandwich the results, in fact, and this is what we obtain. Uh, the optimality theorem that we obtain is this one here. You can see that val of p is sandwiched between tp and tp epsilon plus eta. Unfortunately, eta is not really great, um, and it can't, we didn't find any way to, to improve this. Uh, uh, this very slack uh, error. Um, we also, we tried then to sort of uh, convince the, uh, the readers of our papers that uh, TP and TP epsilon weren't too far apart, okay? Because if, if this were at minus infinity and this at plus infinity, we wouldn't have proved anything interesting, okay? So we tried to convince the reader that val TP epsilon and val TP were not too far apart, and so we proved these two other theorems, one which said, multiplicatively speaking, we are not too far apart, and the other that said, even additively speaking, we are not too far apart, okay? And unfortunately, again, these, this sigma and this E, they are not great, okay? Um, in fact, uh, we've had to um, uh, transform uh, multiplicative distortions into additive distortions, and these are sort of the tools of the, the basic lemma that we've used over and over again in the paper. Um, you can see that uh, somehow this says that the angles between Tx and Ty is more or less like the angle xy plus or minus some tolerance uh, proportional to x and y, and this talks about linear expressions and this talks about quadratic expressions okay so using these three lemmas uh, we've managed to put together a theorem that talks about the whole qp now if you um, if you set q to zero of course all the results go through um, what you get is a projection for the lp in canonical form um, and this is the projected version and in fact, this is the dual uh, to, the to, the, to the original uh, projection that we've already talked about um, before. Okay, so these two theories provides two different uh, arrival points to show that you can project LPs in standard form and LPs in canonical form. In the one case, in the standard form, you project the constraints, and in the canonical form, you project the variables. Okay, so. I'm not going to go into too many details for the uh, tests here, uh, but essentially I've generated a lot of random QPs and the results were not great in the sense that, yes, um, you know, increasing the size doesn't yield a linear or quadratic increase in the complexity of solving uh, or the quality even of the performance quality of solving uh, the projected problems. Um, it's slightly better, I mean, it, it seems to be sort of a, either a square root or a logarithm. What I would have liked to see would really have been something like this. Unfortunately, in QPs, we didn't get this. And so this is, these are empirical results, which means that somehow QPs um, have, either we're not projecting correctly, either there is some scaling factor on the objective, on the objective function that we have not hit upon, uh, which may, be, may well be the case, or else these techniques are not really so great for QPs. They're not bad either, but they're not so great. And the last thing that I want to talk about in the theoretical part would be the k-means uh, MINLP. So um, the k-means problem, everyone I think knows it, um, given points in our M, find clusters 
such that each point is closest to its own to the centroid of the cluster it belongs in. Okay, um, so it gives rise to a very popular heuristic called the k-means algorithm. And why should we want to bother with modeling with an MP? Well, because sometimes you have side constraints that no one has really treated with the k-means, and in that case, your best hope. Uh, not to waste too much time is to uh, whip up uh, an, a mathematical programming formulation and add the side constraints. So this is an MINLP formulation for the uh, um, k-means problem. You can see that I'm defining a centroid with variables uh, yj's and this is the obvious objective function and these are binary uh, uh, variables that assign a, a point to a centroid. Okay, um, this, is, this says that this is a partition and uh, this is the cardinality of the um, of the of each cluster okay so this Hello. can be yes yeah. yes um, fabio had a comment um, yes uh, so uh, yeah so he mentions that the k means is just a, a, a heuristic yes it's a, uh, just, I, I, just uh, Leo, just you, you mentioned the k-means algorithm. Okay, there are, there are good reasons to, for doing something else because k-means just give you a local optimum, not a global one. Sure, I I did I did mention that it's a heuristic called the k-means algorithm. Uh, the, it's also there's also some approximation algorithms based on k-means. So it's not only a heuristic, or maybe it's a heuristic that people have studied, and some people have managed to prove certain approximation results. Um, so it has a status that is slightly more reassuring than any heuristic. On the other hand, it is frighteningly fast and obtains very good optima in many cases. So somehow uh, it's one of those heuristics that you want to keep in your in your closet uh, or maybe no uh, in your in your uh, drawers so for ready use. Um, okay, so thank you, Fabio, for the comment. Um, back to the formulations in fact you can easily reformulate some of the things that you see here for example you can see an objective that is almost convex in the sense that there's a variable multiplying zero one variable multiplying the rest of the term here but it's easy to reformulate this uh, using mccormick constraints um, and this is what uh, you obtain um, actually no, not yet mccormick's i'm just uh, sort of replacing uh, the convex part by another variable big p okay and now this is a reformulation of the uh, centroid definition constraint um, and also i note that everything every continuous variable in fact can be bounded above and below okay so now you're in the situation where you have binary times continuous bounded variables which is also very easy to reformulate using mccormick constraints this time or forte mccormick and what you obtain is a convex MINLP here, okay? You can do better than convex if you're willing to approximate uh, these, this constraint, these constraints uh, by means of other norms uh, and obtain approximate refor uh, reformulations, of course. Uh, but even a CMINLP is not that bad with respect to the non-convex MINLP as we had before. Now, here you can apply random projections in this way by um, you know, inserting in, uh, these projections in, before the data. Uh, unfortunately, here in, in, you have to insert it in before the um, before a, a decision variable, which of course comes matters as I as I explained before. Um, but this this technique yields uh, smaller CMINLP for approximations, and you can get the solutions faster. I'm not presenting any any results in, for this uh, for this application, but you can go look at the paper if you if you're interested. Um, all right, so. The point, the, the theoretical contribution of this paper has been that we've identified what we think is a, a hole in the proof of another paper that sort of proved what we needed, um, and we we fixed it. Okay, we fixed it by having by introducing a completely different technique, meaning additive JLL. Um, but it's uh, but it's, it's it'll be for another talk maybe. Okay, so case studies. I'm going to maybe spend five minutes in this, and then there'll be five minutes left for questions. Okay. So um, diet problem, quantile regression, compressed sensing, and portfolio optimization. I don't think I'll get to the end of this, but let's look at the diet problem. Um, everybody knows the diet problem. This is it, okay? Um, this, uh, these are the constraints. Um, of course, we, uh, we want a standard form. That's not quite standard form, so we can uh, simply uh, introduce slack variables and use a different constraint matrix. And now let's look at the results. This is a first instance with very few nutrients and very few foods, but we get 
uh, exactly the same cost and exactly the same solution. Uh, and this is not retrieved solution. Really, the projected solution is exactly the same as the original solution, okay? Zero error. Um, now, if we increase uh, and we look at a, an inst a single instance, 2,000 by 100, um, we get um, this dependency between the epsilon of the JLL and the precision of the solution, okay? You can see that you can increase the epsilon by a lot. And since the epsilon controls how k, how large k is. Okay, so we started from 2000 constraints and with 0, 01 we get 765 constraints in the projective formulations. With 0, 02 we get 191. And now we can go down up to 16 constraints. This is an aggregation of all of the original constraints, random aggregation, and just 16 constraints are enough to retrieve exactly the same solution. Okay. Um, and then suddenly there's a phase transition here, there's a phase transition effect, and uh, suddenly you get an error, and the error is large. With larger instances, uh, for example, I, I had to uh, locate epsilon sort of by hand in all three cases, but I was able to uh, pinpoint, um, um, you know, the, the, the least epsilon where you would retrieve uh, exactly the same solution, and all infeasibility errors were null, okay? Uh, of course, there's a CPU uh, time saving in every case, so that's not bad. So for the diet problem, diet problem seems to be a large success here. Quantile regression, well, quantile regression is similar to condition to linear. This is linear regression, and quantile regression is not too far from it. It can be modeled by an LP, and this LP has a shape that is usually as follows. It's got a dense part and then two uh, diagonals, okay? So again, a test, I run more than one test, but I'm showing you here one test on a set of um, electrical price uh, prices database. Um, and this is the original problem, and this is the, project, the projected problem. These are the solutions. You can see that they're more or less the same aside from a certain, certain discrepancies, uh, this and this, for example. And then I found out that these discrepancies came about because these are European countries, and uh, from a certain point onwards, they all had the same prices. Okay, so these are simply uh, uh, permutations that apply because some of the data were exactly the same. There's, there was also another bigger instances where I was also able to, um, to show uh, a, a time saving. Okay, so in compressed sensing, um, in fact, I have to spare you all of the details here, but in short, you have to solve an LP such as this one here, okay, which is a reformulation of this uh, program there, okay, and it's used for uh, signal processing, okay. Uh, solving this LP is a well, this is a well studied LP, uh, so many things are understood about the random uh, behavior uh, with random data of these LPs, okay? But I did find somehow that I was able to sort of exceed the expected precisions of these of these um, uh, basis pursuit LPs. And so I was able to send and retrieve um, a, a message using uh, a linear code in a perfect way using much less CPU time, okay? You can see the projected LP and the original LP. Uh, portfolio optimization is a straightforward application of the QP material, uh, but in fact, uh, we used um, we used also some other constraints. Well, we used a, a sort of a, a different formulation of portfolio. This is not the mark of a pure Markowitz. You can see, for 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 instance, that you've got a maximization of the expected return minus the uh, the the risk. So this is a scalarization, and you can see that there are some budget constraints for certain categories of, of stocks and that you you can have short sales so you can have negative variables okay so this was sort of uh, to fill uh, the setting of our to better fill the setting of our qp work and again this you can see that it sort of belongs like the qp work that we've seen before um, in two uh, true data sets here with this particular formulation, which was slightly different from the one above, we can get uh, some interesting uh, objective function ratios here, uh, but we have feasibility errors. So it's not perfect. Okay, so this takes me to 5.25. There's five minutes for questions. This is a list of uh, my papers, but please go look also at other, uh, to other people's papers. For example, Coralia Cartes has some papers in um, out and also in archive concerning uh, 
uh, random projections for, for optimization. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Leo. Um, so if you have a question, could you please raise the hand and um, we will give you the voice. Yeah, I can't see anything as usual, but uh, never mind. Tell me, okay? Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh... Emilio has a question. Hi, Leo. Uh, this is not a technical, but, uh, but a philosophical question. How far can you think uh, we can go with uh, random projections in order to uh, reduce uh, uh, dimensionality in, uh, in the challenging problems in practice many people are facing mm. right now? OK. Uh, um, <laughs> I don't know. I, I think that if you if you have a a lot of data, um, your data may well have both structured and unstructured parts, and because of this, they may be amenable to some application of random projections. Maybe you have to separate certain set of very ordered constraints from certain others and only apply the random projections to the others. Um, but it really depends on, on the, the kind of structures of the, I've observed, for example, that you, if you have a, a constraint matrix that, it, that is part dense and part very sparse, these projections work well. On the other hand, for example, you've, you've seen the results from QP. Uh, those results are not really the best that I could hope for. Um, and, and it's not a question of theory. It's a question of empirical tests. So how far can we go in, to, in practical matters? Well, I've worked on a project by RTE, uh, Réseau uh, Distribution de, de so, pardon me, uh, Transport d'Electricité. So this is the big, uh, big cables, you know, the cables that they carry, I don't know, 20,000 volts across the country. Uh, and uh, they wanted to solve a certain problem connected with uh, the forecast of, uh, uh, of uh, quantity uh, and, and wind, okay? So, uh, so quantity of electricity produced with wind. And so they had a quantile regression problem and uh, we solved it and it was fantastic. It was a, an, an excellent uh, reconstruction of the original problem. Um, but, but then, you know, for some other structures, it just doesn't work well. Or especially if there are integer variables, I still don't know how it works. I mean, I have some sort of tests with no theory behind that shows that it works reasonably well. And then I have some other tests that shows nothing at all. So um, I don't know. I think that there's some hope to use them in practice and some people have used them in practice. Uh, but I think that it really depends on the structure of the, of the problem itself. Thank you very much, Leo. You're welcome. You, you had a Edith Hughes? Sure. Um, if not, I can... can see me? Yes, we can see you and uh, we can hear you. <laughs> Okay, yeah, very nice story, uh, Leo. I, that's what I said. It was a bit surprising to me that you were going into stochastic things. So I, 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 know. Trust, <laughs> I trust Fabio completely on this. One of the uh, counterintuitive things for me in the beginning was that you focus on uh, random directions from a normal distribution. But Mm -hmm. My intuition says, wouldn't it be logical to use only positive um, directions? That means you sample of the unit simplex, for instance. You can do that by negative exponentially drawn and, nor uh, and normalizing, and then you you only go in in the positive uh, in the in the positive sense. Let's say it like that. 
Okay, but that that has an that has an issue, meaning that you can't. I don't know if you can really go back to where I was. Let's see. Um, view mode. Thumbnails. Okay, let's see if I can go quickly up. So it would sort of destroy the theory at this point. Let me let me get it um, here. Okay, so this would fail to hold, and this is the sort of the cornerstone. Of, of all of all of my theory um so if you if you used um any distribution without zero mean uh this result would not i'm sorry okay the, i have some background okay. noise don't 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 worry oh, okay all right did you, <laughs> did you hear me did you understand? <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah i got the point Okay, so anyway, Eligius, uh, it would be great if I could use uh, any distribution I wanted, but I can't. Uh, at least I'm not able to. Okay, so uh, for the time being, I need zero mean uh, distributions with uh, rapidly falling uh, tails. Thank you very much, uh, Leo. Um, is there any other question? I'm checking at the chat. Um, So there don't seem to be any other questions. That was very uh, interesting talk ah, and uh, lots of fine, uh, I can see. good, <laughs> lots of good results to uh, to reduce uh, dimensionality. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for uh, for coming today and uh, and giving thank such you. a thorough thank presentation. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Very great. Yeah, and we we see each other uh, next week. Uh, with the presentation of uh, Coralia Cartis. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, Leo. Bye. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye-bye.